Well, praise God. I'm excited about this. Uh, I told Pastor Mark that uh, back in 1981, I was a part of this church for a short season. And my parents, all my family attended Grace back in the day. And so uh, I, I wish I had time. I have a great story that I tell. Uh, Pastor Harold Nichols, one Sunday after I had, I worked construction during Bible school. My dad owned a construction company here. Worked mainly in the Arlington area, and so uh, we hired all kinds of different characters that come along. There was a man by the name of John, and John showed up one day to work, and had it not been for the fact that John was a man who knew how to work. I mean, this guy was a hard worker, but I mean, he was about the filthiest, dirty sinner you'd ever run across. And uh, John took a lot of delight Every, especially on Monday after the weekend, John took a great delight in telling me about his weekend uh, excursions and what have you not. And it was always stuff I didn't need to hear. And I'd tell him, John, I don't want to hear about your sin. I don't want to listen to it. And uh, so anyway, over a course of I don't, many months, uh, probably six months or, or longer, I convinced John he needed to come to church. He needed to come to Grace. And uh, he said, oh, if I come through those church doors, the roof will fall in. How many have ever heard somebody say that? You know, they, they think they're so big and so important and so bad to the bone, they're going to cave the church in. Well, anyway, John finally decides to come. And he said, well, here's, I'm going to sit on the back row in case I need to escape from that place because, you know, I don't know if you're a bunch of holy rollers or what. And so anyway, Pastor Harold gets up and uh, after, you know, the worship time and everything, he gets up and announces the title to his message. And he says, today's message, the title to today, today's message is how to get Johnny saved. <laughs> well, I mean, I ain't kidding you. He was fuming. And so I convinced, I said, no, 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 I, did. I don't even know the man. I don't know the pastor that well. We'd only been going a short time. And so I convinced him to stay, but I mean, he was hot. So that's all I heard about for the next week. Man, you told on, the, you told on me to that preacher, and he, he just talked. Of course, everything that Pastor Nichols talked about hit home because, man, John was a number one sinner. And so uh, anyway, I convinced him. I swear I didn't tell him. Come one more time, John, just give it one more time. Come next week, and I'm, I'm sure, I'm just sure next week will be the week. You know, in my mind, I'm thinking, man, Johnny needs to get saved, just like <laughs> Pastor Harold said. And so the next week, go through all that. And I mean, John is just like a cat on a hot tin roof. He can't sit still. He's nervous. And Pastor Nichols gets up there, and he says, well, the title of this morning's message is How to Get Johnny Saved, Part 2. And man, John was up and out the door. And I could never get him to come back to church. And, and uh, I share a lot about that story, how the Lord began to show me how to witness to him. But uh, we lost track over a year or so. He ended up moving on, doing something else. But about 10 years after that, 10 years down the road, you know, I'd always thought, man, why couldn't I, why couldn't I have made more of an impact in John's life. Why, you know, I didn't pray. I didn't lead him to Christ. I tried, but he just, man, he just was way too into his sin. Wouldn't even hear of it. Well, 10 years down the road, my parents are in Tulsa, Oklahoma, going to a Benny Hinn crusade. And my dad's name is John. And in the background, he hears, John, John Grisham. My dad's looking around and all of a sudden, it's John that used to work for us. And he said, John, what, what are you doing here? I mean, the last place you ever expect to see somebody like John was at a Benny Hinn crusade. And he said, man, I got saved a couple years ago. And man, I'm just loving it. And he shared his testimony. He said, by the way, he said, how's your son Tim doing? And my dad said, well, he's doing great. And is he still in ministry? Oh, yeah, he's in ministry. And he said, well, listen, I just want you to tell him that I never forgot everything he ever told me. And it really made a difference in my life. See, I didn't know that up front. And sometimes we don't know the impact that we're making in people's lives. Even when on the outside, you know, the Apostle Paul says, while we look not at the things that are seen, 
but the things that are unseen, because the things that are seen, they're temporary. Everything's subject to change. You know, that neighbor next door, that family member, that friend, that person at work, it's all subject to change. But you need to live hard and live strong for Christ, amen? And just know this, that people are watching you. They're watching your life. And what you do, what you say, and how you live counts, amen? amen. Praise God. Well, I want to share with you tonight, and I'm, I'm just going to title my message, What God Has Not Given You. I like talking about the things God has given, amen? I mean, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father, amen? amen. You know, I haven't even done a little commercial, but uh, uh, I brought some of my books, and uh, I'm the author of one book, <laughs> one book so far, <laughs> hallelujah, and I've got another one in the making, and so hopefully this next year it'll come out, but uh, this is a story and I wrote this not from the perspective of the gift of the evangelist because that's what God has called me is to be an evangelist. And so I've been doing that now for a number of years, many years. But I wrote this from the perspective, I put real stories of a true believer because I believe every story in here can be or may be your story already. Every one of us ought to have a story. Every, we ought to have a testimony you know, the Bible says we overcome him by the blood of the lamb and what? The word of our testimony. Then it says, and we love not our lives even unto the death. Right. Wow. So anyway, I, I compiled a, a number of stories. And so in this book, you can start anywhere as long as you start at the beginning of a story and read it through. But uh, the gas station gospel, the gas station gospel is one of the titles you know, you can share Jesus with people. Back in the day uh, when th this actually took place, you would always, there'd be a speaker at the pumps. How many remember that? Where you'd push the button and tell them, you know, hey, I need X amount of dollars worth of gas or whatever before they had the credit card readers. That's going back a ways. But I would get on those speakers and preach the gospel. <laughs> Man, you'd see head turns in the store, you know, looking around, what's going on? There's uh, toilets and tracks. This is an interesting story, toilets and tracks. You know, I love portable outdoor toilets. <laughs> yeah, they're stinky, they're nasty, but everybody has to use them. Man, what a great place to put a track, amen? But you just have to read how that all works out, amen? <laughs> so there's a whole bunch of just weird things, creative I really like to be, and I've always asked the Lord to help me be a creative witness for him. Amen. And uh, so, praise God. You know, one of the first times I ever had any success, I got saved. I'm going in my 50th year of salvation this next year, 40 years filled with the Holy Ghost. And, uh, but one of the first times I had any success is going with Ken Dornhecker right here in Burleson to Dalton's Corner. And I kept listening to Ken uh, over and over about all the results he was getting. And I thought, that poor guy, I mean, you know, I'm going to Bible school so I can stand behind a pulpit. I wanted to be the next Kenneth Copeland, man, or Jerry Savelle, you know. I'm thinking, and he's, he's just out there beating the streets, and yet he's excited about it. <laughs> and, uh, and so he just kept after me, and, man, brother, you need to go. You need to go. And I thought, no. Really, to be honest with you, and man, the Lord has a sense of humor. I thought, you know, that's just sort of for losers. <laughs> that street ministry stuff is for those that God called and you just couldn't make it any other way. And so he just sent you out on the streets because, you know, you really, that's about all you're good for. <laughs> now I be one. <laughs> and have been one for a lot of years. And I'm very excited about it, amen? But I went with Ken. The first time I went with him, man, they jumped out of the car, him and a couple other guys, and they jumped out of the car, and boom, they're gone, and I locked the doors. <laughs> so I ended up sitting in the car for like two hours just praying, and they come back, where have you been? What? I said, man, I've been praying for you guys. <laughs> you know, that's the ministry of stay and pray. There's a lot of people that feel called to that ministry. Stay and pray. Now, I, I believe prayer is important, but 
How many know you can pray and go? You can do two things at once. You can pray and go, not just stay and pray. And so I thought I'd just stay and pray. Well, the next time I went with them, I thought I'll do the same thing. You know, when they get out, I lock the doors and I'm going to stay and pray. Well, they ended up, you know, getting me out of the car and then they locked the doors on me. But the first group of people that I walked up to or I was walking down the sidewalk, as I remember it, right in front of Dalton's Corner, and there was a carload of, of people that was late in the, about this time of the year, maybe a little later in the year, because I remember it was a cool, crisp night. Smoke was rolling out the windows. They were cracked down on the car. And as I walked by, I just felt compelled. I felt drawn to turn. And in my heart, I could hear the Holy Spirit say, go talk to those people in that car. And in my flesh, I thought, there ain't no way. There ain't no way I'm going to do that. But in my heart, my spirit was saying, go talk to those people. And so I obeyed the spirit on the inside of me. See, you've got a spirit of God that resides on the inside of you, the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Amen. And you know, we're, we're good at talking about how big he lives and greater is he that's in us than, or he that's in us than he that's in the world. We're, we're good about talking about him. Amen. But I tell you, we need to put him to, to the test. And I put him to the test that night and I, Walked up and the window come down and it looked like a Cheech and Chong movie, man. The smoke was rolling out and those guys, there's six of them in there, three in the front, three in the back. They were smoking dope and, you know, just doing what young people were doing at that time. And the guy looks at me and he holds his, you know, joint out here. You want some? I said, no, man, I got something for you. Really, what do you got for me? And I don't remember word for word what I said, but I just begin to talk to him about Jesus. I didn't preach. I just began to talk to them about Jesus and how that, I, I think I remember, you know, I could be home tonight with my wife and little babies, but instead I'm here tonight because God loved you enough. And I love God enough to obey him, to come walk up to you, complete strangers, we don't know each other, and tell you that Jesus loves you, Amen. that he wants to give you eternal life so that you don't spend eternity in hell. And I don't know how God did it, but he did. And that night, all but one put their joints away in their beers and I invited them to receive Jesus and they prayed out loud and asked Jesus in their hearts. That night changed me forever. It really did, it changed me forever. I wanna read some scriptures to you real quick. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, this is familiar, I'm sure, to all of us, but I want to begin in verse 3, and I'm going to read it out of the Good News translation. Timothy says, I give thanks to God whom I serve with a clear conscience as my ancestors did. I, I thank him as I remember you always in my prayers night and day. I remember your tears and I want to see you very much so that I may be filled with joy. I remember, Paul talking to Timothy, I remember the sincere faith that you have. The kind of faith your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice, also had. I'm sure that you have it also. Boy, this is encouraging. You know, if somebody were to begin to talk to you or write you a letter or send you an email or shoot you a text that says, you know, I know you're a person of faith. Man, you got a strong family of faith. In fact, I believe you're, you know, you're believing God strong and you're living strong as much as ever. But he goes on to say, for this reason, I remind you to keep alive the gift that God gave you when I laid my hands on you. For the spirit that God has given us does not make us timid. Well, I like this translation or this version rather. Does not make us timid. Instead, his spirit fills us with his power, love, and self-control. Do not be ashamed then of witnessing for our Lord. You know, a lot of times I, I memorized uh, verse seven. When I first got, you know, saved and got into the word, I, I memorized because I struggled with fear in my life. I mean, just really struggled with it. And I remember confessing, you know, all the time, God's not giving me a spirit of fear. God's not giving me a spirit of fear, but a love, power, and a sound mind. And I was usually confessing that when I was really fearful. But, you know, that's better than saying, I'm afraid, I'm afraid, I'm afraid. Amen. But he goes on to say here, 
His spirit fills us with power, love, and self-control. Do not be ashamed then of witnessing for the Lord. Neither be ashamed of me, a prisoner for Christ's sake. Instead, take your part in suffering for the good news. You know, that's just one of them phrases you'd sort of like to pass over. (laughs) You know, the suffering stuff. But for the good news. As God gives you the strength for it. You know, probably every one of us in here could maybe stand up and give a testimony about how you've been persecuted or maybe somebody, you know, maybe you missed out on a promotion or lost a job or who knows, you know, the different things that happen. Why? Because of your faith, because of your stand, because of the fact that you are a Christian. And even more so in the day that we're living in and the culture that we're we're navigating through, even more so. But we need to understand that Jesus said, he told us that uh, all those who desire to live godly will suffer persecution. Those who desire to live godly. I don't know about you, but that's my desire, is to live godly. My desire is to be just like Jesus. And I know I'm just like Jesus, Pastor Mark, in my spirit. I know that, but it's the rest of me. You know, it's that soul, it's that mind, the will, the emotion. It's the flesh that sometimes isn't a perfect representative or doesn't represent Christ perfectly. But like Paul, we ought to be pressing towards the mark. Amen? Amen? That ought to be our desire. And so anybody that desires to live godly, listen, just settle it right now. People are, you're going to receive persecution. Man, I don't know. Maybe there's been some, I've never had to suffer persecution to the shedding of my own blood. Thank God. But man, many are today. And maybe that day's yet ahead. I don't know. But whatever persecution I've suffered doesn't even begin to measure up to what the apostles suffered. Man, we really do. We've had it easy. I don't know how, how easy the days ahead are going to be, but we've pretty much had it easy. The church, for the most part, here in America, has had it pretty easy. But I tell you what, it's, it's time to stand up. It's time just to know that, man, I, listen, if there's some persecution to face, if there's something to go through like that, if there's a suffering to go through, it's not because God is judging you or God is putting something on you, but it's because you're making a difference, praise God. <laughs> Glory to God. I mean, you're giving the devil a hair lip, a fat lip, and it makes him mad. He doesn't like it. And so, you know, people, you know, they push back, but we just keep pushing the gospel. Let me read on here. It says that we're not ashamed and how that we take our part in the suffering for the good news as God gives us strength. He saved us and called us to be his own people, not because of what we've done, but because of his own purpose and grace. Man, every one of us in here tonight, we've got a purpose and grace, a purpose, a divine purpose, and the grace that's there to help us, that grace that's there that's already provided for us. Praise God. I like uh, a man by the name of Andrew Womack. I like how he talks about grace is everything God's already provided for you and faith is what he's given you, the ability to receive it. Amen. So God will grace us. You know, going into this tent meeting this week and even prior to that, all the planning and all the work that's gone into it, there's a grace. Amen. Amen. Man, I never saw so many happy people last night willing to work and sweat. I mean, what is that? That's grace. Man, when you get people that'll come and and just pour out their sweat and work hard and be happy about it, that's awesome. Amen. So thank you for doing that. What a blessing. He gave us his grace by means of Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but now it has been revealed to us through the coming of our Savior Christ Jesus. He has uh, ended the power of death through the gospel and has revealed to us immortal life. And all that being said, remember, God's not given you a spirit of fear. I want to read what the Apostle Paul wrote in 
in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Then I want to share a couple stories with you. Now I, Paul, starting in verse 1, appeal to you with the gentleness, and I'm reading out of the New Living Testament, appeal to you with the gentleness and kindness of Christ, though I realize you think I'm timid in person and bold only when I write from far away. Well, I'm begging you now so that when I come, I won't have to be bold with those who think we act from human motives. We are human, but we don't ward or wage war against human as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons. Now, this is that verse where it talks about in the King James, casting down imaginations and every high thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. New Living Testament reads differently, and I like how it reads. We are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. Boy, I mean, uh, Ken's told me a lot of stories. That's one thing out of all the different types of evangelistic ministry that we've done over the years. Uh, and I've, I've been in schools and preached in high schools and especially back in the 90s, a lot of schools. I've been in other countries, pre but I've never went on a college campus. But you know, that's, that's sort of what you're up against is that reasoning, uh, proud arguments. But you know, I've found it true that some of those same reasonings and some of those same proud arguments that keep people from finding God keep you and I from talking to Him. It's true. I realized that about my own self a number of years ago. In fact, I realized it back in 1982 or three, whenever it was that we were out there on Dalton's Corner talking to those people, I realized that I was fearful. I realized that I had a lot of excuses, a lot of proud arguments, a lot of reasoning in my mind why, you know, that ministry was for people that couldn't make it in any other kind of ministry. Sorry, Ken, but you know, you and I are cut out of the same cloth. I mean, you know, little did I realize, it took me a few years. In fact, in 1984, we left here, uh, moved back to Colorado where we were initially from, and we started a church in 1984. We pastored for just right at three years. I, I tell people, you know, people pestered us and we pestered them. We, we didn't pastor, we just pestered each other. Finally, we all got delivered, praise God. And, uh, and I realized I had another evangelist, a great missionary, who since went on to be with the Lord. He asked me the question, when are you going to answer the call of the evangelist on your life? What are you doing trying to pastor? And so in 1987, uh, we've never looked back. We've always been ministering in the, in the ministry and under the ministry of the evangelist, amen, my wife and I. And so anyway, uh, I forgot, I got sidetracked there and I don't have my wife Peggy here to keep me on track. She'll be here Friday, amen. She's flying back with me. Uh, I leave tomorrow to do a funeral of a close family member and then uh, we'll be back here Friday. But anyway, so uh, I gotta get back on track. The whole point, I don't even know what the point was. <laughs> Ken, Becky. You're not even paying attention if you can't help me any better than this. Where was I at, guys? Tell me where I was at. I mean, I drew a blank. 1987, thank you. Somebody's helping me. Thank you, Jesus. Help from, from the congregation. Help the man preach. So 1987, I answered that call. And, uh, but I still struggled with this thing called fear. You know, it was just, this is amazing to me, Pastor Mark, and I don't remember your name, and I'm so sorry. Carmen. Forgive me, Carmen. <laughs> but it was just a couple days ago. I was thinking about what am I going to minister here? What am I going to share? And I was thinking about how fearful I was. 
And I thought, Lord, where, where? I mean, I know where the spirit of fear comes from. It's from the devil. It's not from God. But I said, Lord, how, how did that thing, you know, was I born with it? Where did it come from? And this is literally just a couple days ago as I'm driving all those hours here. The Lord revealed to me in 1977, he said, is when the door to fear was opened in your life. In 1977, I was on my way to work, had just graduated high school, going to do construction work with my dad. He owns the company, and so that's, I grew up doing that, and so we're on our way to work, and we're driving down the little country road from where we live in Colorado, and it was a foggy morning, and uh, he said, boy, it looks like one of the neighbor's cows got out or a calf and got hit that's laying on the side of the road, something brown laying on the side of the road, and he said, I'll pull up and unroll your window. He said, we'll go back to the house and call Charlie. I think one of his calves got hit. And so dad pulled up, you know, on the shoulder of the road. I rolled down the window, stuck my head out, only to see a man laying in a brown leisure suit, 1977, you know, a brown leisure suit. Some of you younger people are like, you'll have to Google it, all right? You just, you know, go, you'll probably be wearing one soon. You know, that's probably coming back. He's laying on his back with his arms crossed on his chest, his wrists duct taped together, his face covered with duct tape, and his brains are all over the ground. Somebody had assassinated him. In fact, just today, I went online and found the police reports and everything from 1977. And I remember from that moment forward at night, I wouldn't be able to sleep as, as an 18-year-old kid. And at night, I would get up and look out the window, and I could see across the farm fields that very location from, from our front living room window. And I'd see car lights right over by where I found this man that had been assassinated. And man, fear just, I mean, it just took over my life. And it operated on every level it could operate on. But then in 1981, I come to Fort Worth, Texas, to Kenneth Copeland's Southwest Believers Conference. I think it was the very first one, 1981. Pastor Harold, uh, or not, uh, it wasn't Pastor Harold, it was uh, John Osteen. Pastor John Osteen on Saturday morning prayed and I got full of the Holy Ghost. And from that moment forward, the spirit of fear was broken my life. But you know, I still had to deal with it raising its ugly head from time to time. I share this with you because I really felt like tonight that, you know, there's some of you, I believe, that are going to go to a new, new level of witnessing for the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the Bible has called us all to be his witness. The Bible says, he that winneth souls is wise. And that God has given the ministry, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, God has given to each one the ministry of reconciliation as though Christ were imploring through you for men and women, boys and girls to be reconciled to God. Every one of us have that ministry of reconciliation. Every one of us were, were called to be his ambassador for Christ's sake. And yet I struggled with this fear. And I believe that tonight there'll be those of you that God, you're, you're going to let God take you to another level of being a witness and a soul winner for Jesus. Others of you, you maybe you're just, you know, you just need to flat out be delivered from the spirit of fear. You might be a faith giant in a lot of other areas and praise God, man. But when it comes to talking to people, talking to strangers or even the people at work, people at school, your neighbors, whatever, it's just a lot easier to look the other way and keep on keeping on. Am I right? I mean, sometimes it's just, and boy, in today's culture, I mean, let me tell you what, they're, you know, people are, are getting mean. They're getting mean about it. But that's no reason to fear. Because where the darkness abounds, grace abounds much more. Hallelujah. I'm up for the challenge. How about you? So I believe tonight, some of you are going to a new level. Others of you are going to be delivered, amen, from a spirit of fear. Why? Because God's not giving it to you. But let me tell you how I got free from fear real quick with the few minutes I have left. I'll tell you how I got rid of fear. Number one, 
you know, that was 82, 83 when I come, moved here from Colorado to go to Bible school and, and Ken, I just, I thought, man, how could anybody be that excited about going out witnessing? You know, I, as a Baptist, I went, my parents had a, a bus ministry and I went on Saturdays as a kid knocking on doors and talking to people about, you know, their kids going to church on Sunday with the bus ministry and I hated it. I hated it. I thought, why? What are we doing this? Wasting a good Saturday, you know? I just hated it. And even after getting saved and after, you know, going to Bible school and after going into ministry, you know, I, I, the Lord takes a lot of humor in knocking on doors. That's what we're doing now is go, as we do Awake America to the rural areas of America and set up the tent, one of the deals is to go knock on doors and put out door hangers and talk to people. And, you know, in the flesh, I don't, I don't like it to this day. I mean, I'm not like, oh, I cannot wait to go knock on somebody's door. I just, I can't wait. Now, I've heard some of you are really fanatical, and you just couldn't wait to go do it. That's awesome. I'm just being honest with you. You know, my flesh, you know, my flesh doesn't want to exercise. You can tell. I mean, I just, just doesn't want to do it. I mean, it loves ice cream. I don't have any problem getting my flesh to eat ice cream, especially at night, a little vanilla, pour some coffee over it. Coffee float, oh my gosh, yeah. But my flesh don't want to exercise. But then when was your flesh ever supposed to be in control? When was your mind ever supposed to be in control? It's the spirit that's in you that's to control your mind. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Think upon whatsoever things are good and pure and holy and you know, think on these things. Cast down vain imaginations and every thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing every thought into the captivity and obedience of Christ, punishing all disobedience. You know, the way I broke through the barrier of fear was that I decided to do what the Bible says to do, do what the apostle Paul was telling us here in 2 Corinthians. And I just decided every time that fear arose and I'd hear this little voice, well, you know, that guy over there, man, look at all those tattoos. I mean, he looks like one rough character. And I'd think, well, that'd be the last person you probably would really, they, you know, they don't want to hear about God. I mean, they got skulls all over and they're tattooed and, you know, now it's sort of the thing. But, you know, back in the 80s, it, you, you were like either in prison or you belonged to a biker club. I mean, it wasn't a stylish thing to be tattooed all over. And, the, and I'd hear the Holy Ghost say, go for the big ones. Go for the giant." Go for the giants. And so every time my mind would say, well, don't, don't say anything to this. Well, just, you know, no, I, I feel compelled to go pray for this person at Walmart. I mean, they're right behind me, and I don't know what it is, but after all, we're in Walmart. <laughs> you know, I've decided at Walmart, no matter where you go in the United States of America, it's Halloween every day at Walmart. <laughs> I mean, there's the craziest people. I hope y'all don't go to Walmart in your pajamas. I mean, Walmart, you, you want to, you miss the circus, go to Walmart, you know? But you're standing in Walmart and the Holy Ghost on the inside says, you know, just turn around and talk to that person. You're like, there ain't no way. I mean, not in Walmart. And that's when you have to make the decision. Are you going to listen to the lying voice or are you going to go for the giant? Come on, are you going to go for the giant or not? You know, I found out that the ones that are really scary are the little old ladies. It's not the tattooed people. You know, I, we, we went to Daytona Beach and numerous times set up our tent in the largest campground for the bikers. Cackleberry Campground. I mean, there's wicked people there. But there's also some good people, but there are a lot of wicked people there. Man, we set up our tent and get right in the middle of what, you know, the devil's just having a heyday, and we cook free pancakes for everybody. You know, even wicked people have to eat. They do. I 
man, if you feed wicked people and, and you, you establish a little bit of a connection there, I mean, after all, they're eating free pancakes, so you can talk to them about Jesus. Amen. Even when they show up in their underwear. We have people show up in their, well, I won't even say it. Not much. Show up half naked for breakfast. They, you know them half naked people need Jesus. Bikers need Jesus. Your neighbor needs Jesus. Amen. Amen. 1988, I went on time of prayer and fasting seven days. I've never done it since. I mean, I pray, I've prayed and fasted, but never seven days. Just, it was a bad experience. <laughs> Sorry, I mean, uh, you know, I'll do it if the Lord tells me to do seven days, I'll do it, but I have not heard that since. <laughs> seven days later, you know, all my dreams were of pizza and McDonald's and French fries and <laughs> anybody think I got a problem there? <laughs> But out of that time of prayer and fasting, the Lord spoke to me. He said, I want you, and this was in the, I don't know, November or something right before Thanksgiving. He says, I want you to dress up like Santa Claus and go to bars and nightclubs in your town and tell people about Jesus. I thought, there ain't no get thee behind me, devil. I thought, a lot of good this did. I can hear the devil real good, but I don't hear anything from God. Well, you can read more about that story in my book, but long story short, I, I struggled and struggled and struggled. And on the Sunday morning after the fast, uh, a lady come up to me and she said, oh, Brother Grisham, I'm so excited. The Lord spoke to me this week. And he said, when you got back from your time of prayer and fasting in the mountains of Colorado, she said, the Lord told me to give you something. I thought, now this thing's working. Now the prayer, you know, the fasting is starting to produce. <laughs> Man, I didn't know Jack. <laughs> I went out to her car and she says, it's in my trunk. And I thought, oh, praise God, man. You got to haul it in your trunk, a bag full of money or something. I go to her trunk and lo and behold, she pulls out brand new in the wrapping still, a Santa Claus suit. <laughs> the Lord spoke to me to give this to you. Well, there's a, another story behind that. I won't go into it, but I ended up obeying God. 1988. And for the last 30, whatever, how many years that's been, every Christmas, I go to the bars and the nightclubs, been all over the United States, many different countries. And I dress up like Santa Claus. And right, in fact, right now as we speak, I have a lady making me a brand new, I mean, top of the line, embroidery. I think even gonna have my name on the inside. Santa suit. And I go every Christmas to the bars and the nightclubs. I've been down on Bourbon Street in every single nasty joint there is in New Orleans. And when I walk through the door as Santa, let me tell you something, there's a grace, there's an anointing to do things. I don't just, I know other people that have done it and they've had some success, but you know, God, God spoke to me. That was a me word, so I'm not trying to get recruits, Santa recruits, you know. But if you want to try it, it's pretty awesome. And I go in those bars and nightclubs and many times there'll be a live band playing and as soon as they see Santa, they don't know, they think the bar hired me. And I walk in through the doors, Pastor Mark, and all of a sudden they'll stop whatever they're playing and they'll start playing, here comes Santa Claus, here comes Santa. Hey, Santa, come on up here. And man, they... They do the fatal mistake. They hand Santa the microphone. <laughs> Santa, give us a word. Oh, Santa's got a word. <laughs> and you know, I don't, I don't curse them. I don't, you know, you need to repent, you bunch of filthy sinner. No, I say, you know, I'm here to give you, oh, I want every one of you to receive a gift. I brought everybody a present here tonight. Oh, yeah. I mean, people are fired up. And I got my elves working the crowd. We've got tracks and candy canes. Well, not them chinchy little nickel things, man. Some big candy canes. We're passing them out and uh, going from table to table. And I tell them how, listen, Santa has the best gift. It's called eternal life. It's never going to wear out. You're not going to have to stand in line to 
take it back. Amen. Listen, I want to encourage you tonight. I could tell stories for hours. I want to encourage you. Stand up to the fear. Father, right now, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I believe this is a word of deliverance that in Jesus' name, people are loose now. Loose now. If you're struggling with fear, I, I say in the name of Jesus, be free in Jesus' mighty name. Father, thank you for the labors that we've been praying for. The labors for the harvest because the harvest is plentiful in Jesus' name.